Welcome to the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast, where we equipped you to more effectively lead your seat at any employer, business, or industry in which you choose to play. Each week, we help you sharpen your leadership acumen by cracking open the playbooks of dynamic leaders who are doing big things in their professional endeavors. And now your host, leadership tactics and organizational development expert, Karen Farrell-Rhodes. Hey there, superstars. This is Karen, and welcome to today's episode. You know, we all try to show up as our best selves in our professions, right? But at various times in your career, you may be asked to take on roles or projects that you may question if you want to take them or if you're ready to take them. And while the request may initially feel unsettling, there are particular aspects to consider to help you to determine if the opportunity is a go or no go for you. Our guest today has had many such career transition decisions as it comes with the territory when you're considered extremely valuable to your organization or business. I am so happy to have as today's guest, Ms. Sharika Epko, who's the former SVP and Interim Chief Human Resources Officer at Anaplan. Anaplan is a leading cloud native platform for orchestrating business performance, and they were recently acquired by Tama Bravo, one of the largest private equity firms in the world. You know, before her stint at Anaplan, Sharika held a leadership position at Google, the United States Digital Service, and the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. She is a master at storytelling and candidly shares her decision-making process when she faced numerous opportunities, some that she wanted and some that she wasn't sure she wanted. So enjoy her stories. You're going to learn a lot from them. And be sure to stay tuned to the end and listen to my closing segment called Karen's Take, where I share a tip on how to use insights from today's episode to further sharpen your leadership acumen. And now enjoy the show. Hey there, superstars. This is Karen and welcome to today's episode at the Lead of the Top of Your Game podcast. I am super thrilled to have um, a guest on the show today who is the epitome of a person that um, has mastered resiliency in times of change in the world of corporate American corporate business. Uh, on today's episode, we are absolutely thrilled to have Sharika Epo, the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Anaplan. And Anaplan is an enterprise level software as a service uh, company. And their solutions really work on transforming how enterprises see, plan, and drive business performance. So, welcome to the show, Sharika. We're so Thank happy to you. have you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm doing fantastic today. Thank you for asking. I'm even better now that I'm talking with you. <laughs> Girl, listen, I am um, excited yeah. um, just to to share and, and learn from you and all of your wonderful concepts and your book and everything else. So looking oh, forward to it. Thank you. And right back at you. I mean, we're going to be having nuggets, I'm sure, to have tons of nuggets to share with our listeners. But before we get started, what I would love for you to do, Sharika, is just to, you know, just share a little bit with our audience about your background, maybe where you grew up and a little bit about your educational and career journey thus far. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so I am the proud daughter of Milton and Aitha Shaw, and they are immigrants from the Caribbean. So my dad is Jamaican and my mom's Bayesian. Um, mm -hmm. And I was born in Washington, D.C. And so for those who don't know, D.C. is the melting pot of culture and um, opportunity. And so growing up in the DMV, as we like to call it, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, you know, there was a lot of opportunity to um, to share that culture. Mm -hmm. But with that culture came kids being mean or me trying to figure out how to fit in. My parents are blue collar workers. So, you know, I graduated from high school in Bowie, Maryland, went on to Howard University to study business. And as a first generation college student, you know, I had to find my way. And so, you know, early on in life, I understood the benefit of having mentors because 
those mentors really helped shape who I am today by helping me navigate the college admissions process, then on to um, career aspirations and goals. But I, I really, along the way, struggled to fit in and made a uh, made it my business to really join a lot of affinity groups and clubs and things while I was in college and not only join them, but lead them. <clears throat> and um, that leadership in building community is what I did as I started my career in finance at JP Morgan. And, uh, you know, I did that for about four and a half years and then quickly realized that I needed to get some additional education. And, you know, my parents always saw the U.S. Um, and its education system as an opportunity for me to grow and learn and to do better than them. And so they pushed me and I went on to get my MBA um, full time from the University of Maryland Smith Business School and then used that to transition into um, the federal government, where I spent 10 years at a number of different agencies like DHS and then ultimately the White House. But I will tell you, um, throughout that entire educational and um, early career journey, I led a number of community groups. And that work led me to um, ERG and diversity work as a collateral duty. And then over time, I just that turned into my full time job, which is how it kind of led me to be the chief diversity and inclusion officer at Amplan. Wow, what a story. I bet we could talk for a month on all of those experiences (laughs) that you had. Um, But one of the things that I, that really has impressed me about you, um, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, was the amount of resiliency and courage to dip your toe in the water and to Mm -hmm. do a few different things. And I'm curious as if that was something that was just part of your nature or something that um, maybe your parents instilled in, in you, because I know a lot of people struggle with the unknown. Yes. And yes. leading people in an area that you might not be as familiar with. And so I'm just curious about uh, what gave you the courage to you know, take up leadership roles in college and, and do mm-hmm. different, um, try different industries. What are some of your thoughts interesting. there? Yeah. Um, so let me just say, I'm a Sagittarius, right? So I'm oh, a fire Oh my gosh. When's your birthday? <laughs> it's December 4th. December 19th. Wow. Oh, right? so I'm right are... on that cusp though. <laughs> Yes, we have so much in common. But we do. <laughs> as um, you know, as the stars aligned, I'm a very adventurous person. And I will say throughout my career, I've really centered myself on a single goal, and that's to ascend in my career, but also making a difference at every step of the way. I, I will say a lot of my ambition comes from my parents. Um, and I used to joke when I was younger, but I would say I am Jamaican for real because I had about <laughs> two, three jobs at a time, all the time, until all the time. I was at least 30, 30 years old. Um, but I think that curiosity allowed me to never limit myself into one single industry or sector. And that's why I can stand here today and say, you know, I've worked in the financial industry sector. I've worked in the public sector with the federal government. I've worked in the technology sector and I'm still here now. Mm -hmm. And all of those experiences um, have helped with very well-known organizations and some lesser known have really just helped me to um, understand how people work Mm -hmm. and Better yet, how I can contribute to that organization or that community while I'm there. And I always found it um, useful to pursue opportunities where I felt like I could help shape the workplace or its trends or have a really meaningful impact. Oh, and I, I love that. And I think that desire, a lot of your you know peers and colleagues, a lot of us out here have that same desire, just... I don't think we wake up not wanting to be at our best and not yeah. wanting to make a difference. Um, I think we go in waking up in the morning wanting to do that, but things kind of, our obstacles hit us sometimes mm-hmm. <laughs> during the day or during the week mm-hmm. uh, that might distract us. So, But um, how do you approach when a curveball comes your way, when you're having to lead either an initiative or organization and here comes a curveball you weren't seeing? What are some of your initial thought processes? Because I know that's a place that a lot of people struggle with, you know? Yeah, I think, you know what? Um, fear is very crippling, right? And I really do try to ask myself, like, what's the worst that can happen? And over the years, I've just found that, you know, 
I, I had to rethink and figure out how I prioritize like my family and my health and those mm-hmm. kinds of things. But one of the things that, you know, I really lean into is stepping outside of my comfort zone mm-hmm. because that has had the single largest impact on my career trajectory, mm-hmm. right? Like it's been exponential and not linear. And so I think that's because I've looked at obstacles and fears um, as a dichotomy, right? Like it's a part art and part science. Right. I don't know, you know, I don't have the answers to everything, but I will tell you, I am adventurous in my Sagittarius ways in that (laughs) I like to, you know, um, really just kind of test the waters. Um, Mm -hmm. But you definitely have to have courage when you do that. And Mm -hmm. the courage is something that I think I've gotten from my grandmother my grandma, my dad's mom is 93 years old and she left Jamaica. She had nine children, brought each and every one of them here. Um, and she says, she reminds us, she's like, hey, I only finished school at, at the eighth grade level. But if you met her, spoke with her, worked with her, you know that you would never know that unless she told you. Yeah. So the courage that she exhibited is something that I know was instilled in me. And so I really just try to think about um, what I want to do and really put my mind to it. Yes. And then I, I look around and ask myself who's done it before, but I don't get bogged down in what their journey is because I'm a unique individual. I do know yes. that. Right. And, and right. we all have our own story. And so I try to use, you know, some of my mentors or my sponsor's journey as a blueprint, but not as an exact science. So oh I God. use that outline, but then try to customize it to Sharika and Sharika's journey. Okay. You're just a sister from another mother. Let me just put it out there right now <laughs> because I am the same way. I've never been the, that girl to be put in a box per se. Yes. I've always been the one that was tapped on for special projects or yep. big things because I knew I had the capability of doing that. Um, and then similar to you, um, my grandparents on both sides, um, you know, did not finish school. Some stopped in elementary and some, and some stopped the ninth grade was the oldest, um, of mm-hmm. both sides of my grandparents. And fortunately they've both passed away now, but, but similar to you, to them that they, you wouldn't have never known that they exactly. didn't go to college. They were well-renowned in their communities, um, super sharp and smart. It was just amazing. And with that type of upbringing, I kind of understand where your gumption and your, I won't say fearlessness, but your ability to tackle the unknown Mm -hmm. uh, comes from. And one of the things I always love to share with the individuals, I'm like you as well. Now I do have a fear of failing. So I don't like to fail. Now I'll be out there and do it, but I, I always want to win. I always want to be the best event or initiative or whatever it is I'm doing that I can do. But I always say there's nothing short of murder that we can't change. That's right. So knowing that, you know, I love that. we should all at least try. Yeah. I love, love, love that. And, you know, I, I mean, I agree with you. I th- you know, being a competitive person, you always want to win. But I will tell you, Karen, I've learned the most from my failures. Me too. Yeah. You know, and yes. so- it's interesting because, you know, on social media, IG and everything else, people only share their successes. They very rarely share their failures, but people learn the most themselves yeah. and others by learning what not to do. So yeah. I'm, I'm really trying to examine that as well yeah. and, and use journaling as an opportunity for me to um, transform my next actions when I do fail. Tell me a little bit more about your journaling. I tr- I try that, but I'm not consistent with it, but I know it works for a lot of people. So it might be a resource for our listeners to try. Girl, um, so what do you get from journaling? Let me tell you something. First of all, I got one journal for this activity, another journal for that. Oh, like this it's journal for this activity. <laughs> Let me just uh, you say, can run the world with all that. <laughs> you, like, literally, like just three different journals for different walks of life. And I will tell you, one Love is that. for work. Okay. One is for my board seats. Nice. And the nice. other is like for community activities. Um gotcha. and, and and giving back. And I will tell you, um, 
I'm old school in that way because I need to write things down to commit it to memory. Mm. But it's also just turning the pages and going back and being reflective. And so journaling is just another way for me to go back and be reflective. And if I go in my office, I can show you like journals from years on years on years. Um, so it's also a really good opportunity for me at the end of the year, when I start trying to do like my vision board for the next year, or I start to try to hold myself accountable for the goals or accomplishing or not the goals that I set for myself. And so I'm not perfect with it either. I don't do it um, like every single day, but I will say for meetings and things like, you know, people have their iPads or other meeting uh, electronic ways of taking notes. I prefer to write. I just prefer to write. And I think it is something about committing my thoughts to memory that gives me that extra energy um, to go forth and, and achieve my goals. And it, it, the one last thing I'll say is really about manifestation. Mm-hmm. Not only do I write it, but then I speak it and the God, Lord speak above helps existence. me to achieve it. Absolutely. Uh, preach, girl. Preach. Oh, yes. <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. Well, you know what? You've inspired me to try it again. Maybe I just, it's okay not to do it every single day. Maybe Mm -hmm. I just pick a couple days during the week because I do like to reflect. Yes. And I usually do that in the moment, but committing it to a journal probably would be very helpful, to be honest with you. Yeah. Definitely. (laughs) So, Sharika, I know one of the things that um, are more recent experiences you've had was that you were, you know, tapped on for an um, interim chief human resources officer um, stint. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because a lot of um, our audience listeners are, you know, tapped on for special projects or interim roles or, or what have you. And I'm so, I'm just curious um, if you could share of course, not all, any uh, details about, you know, confidential details about the role, yeah. but how you approached it and thought about it once you were tapped on that, knowing that you would be doing, um, you know, a major uh, leadership role within your organization, had a lot of eyes, I'm sure, uh, watching you and a lot of ears listening to you. And I know you have the great skills for the job, but I just uh, would love for you to share how you thought about tackling that type of role. And for as much as you can share a little bit about your learnings in that experience. Wow. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you for asking that. Um, (laughs) I will go back to something you said earlier, right? Um, Around that fear. When I was tapped on the shoulder, July, early July of 2021, I said, no, I was like, thank you. That's so nice. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think that'd be great. But, you know, wow. I'm good um, where I am. Mm-hmm. Um, How did they take you saying no? Were they shocked? Well, they, it, it, they didn't take it, actually. They were like, just think about it. You don't have to respond <laughs> right now. <laughs> and I'm glad they, they gave me that space because it gave me a chance to step outside of my comfort zone. Mm-hmm. And what I know, Karen, is... Mm-hmm. Um, When I took the job with Google years ago and I moved my entire family across country from Northern Virginia to Santa Clara, California, that was a huge risk and it paid off exponentially. There are several stories like that in my career that I can share with you, but I felt like this is one of those moments. Mm -hmm. And so I had to really um, sit back and ask myself, what do you have to lose? Right. Um, Right. Going to Anaplan as the inaugural chief diversity officer, um, I was drawn to Anaplan because of its culture, my ability to have impact, the Anaplan values, you know, all of that. And none of those things had changed. So I asked myself, then, why would you not do this? Well, some of the considerations, you know, I had to take into account as being a wife and a mom, right? So I'm a proud mom of three kids. Um, One, I have an adult daughter. She's doing very well for herself. So I'm living in New York, but I also have two little ones here in first and third grade. But I have a very supportive husband, Ayaname, and he said, go for it. Like, I got it. Don't worry about it. And I think having a supportive spouse and yeah. family is one of the key learnings, right? You asked about what I learned. <laughs> what I learned yeah. what I think you need is, is that, right? Having that support because I knew that it was going to stretch me, pull me in directions that I had not yet seen. And when I tell you that um, when I said yes, it actually, you know, I asked for some conditions to be met. 
and they met them. Right. So our board was extremely supportive in providing me with a mentor. Our board was extremely um, supportive in providing me with some additional um, vendor resources. Um, And our board was supportive in providing the transparency that I needed to lead at the CHRO level. And oh, fantastic. it was an absolutely exhausting experience, <laughs> but an amazing one because being able to take a business from um, the New York Stock Exchange to a private company um, and build the leadership team back up to where it needs to be in order for the business to be successful is one of my greatest accomplishments. Oh, congratulations. That is amazing. Thank you. Uh, I know you've done a lot of great work in a short period of time there um, in that interim role, but anyone who's been through any type of major transformation or change knows how difficult it is, not only to execute it, but to bring others along on the journey Mm -hmm. as well. Um, So it's, it sounds amazing that you had a great support network. But to be honest with you, a lot of folks out there don't. I mean, yeah. we're pretty lucky to be able to do that, lucky and blessed to be able to have that. When there are things that you may not have known yes. the right process or known the way, <laughs> well, how did you tackle those? Can I just say, um, going from being a peer mm-hmm. to the lead is a very humbling experience yes. because you have to build trust within your team and you have to earn it. It's not given to you. Right. Right. And so um, building that trust allowed me to exercise a bit of humility because Mm -hmm. what I know is what I know, but there are things that I don't know. And so I wasn't afraid to ask questions. And I tell people all the time, it's one thing to, you know, take a role and be Mr. or Mrs. Know-it-all, but it's another thing to be curious yeah. And so for me, I went in with this curiosity that allowed me to ask questions and all the dumb ones too, right? Like I, and, and I was able to say, hey, I'm new to this. Help me mm-hmm. understand this or that or this process. And because there was a level of familiarity in most cases that played in a positive light for me, but in other cases, right, I needed to make sure that I was well positioned to succeed and to continue to lift up my HRLT who used to be my peers. Right. 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 So that, I will tell you, that is probably one of the more challenging um, areas. But I also uh, leaned on a strong community of other HR practitioners and CHROs, um, because what I quickly realized is that we were all dealing with the same types of people issues, right? (laughs) Yes. Yes. I didn't have to try to tackle this alone and we never had to share, you know, like proprietary details or anything, but people are people. And what I say all the time are people are unpredictable. So I don't care how well you plan, just have your plan to have your plan derailed. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Yeah. People are unpredictable, but yeah. All right. Well, we're going to add that to our leadership playbook around, you know, when you're having to take on uh, expansive roles, um, having the courage and the vulnerability to ask questions. Yes. And to position it as admitting that you don't know what you don't know, but you're yes. very curious about their input and feedback and opening that door mm-hmm. to getting more data and information, as well as finding um, a supportive network that you can go to in confidence to yes. bounce ideas and to talk through or learn from best practices. Absolutely. Yeah. That's good. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. You know, I I did write a book on leadership execution, and I always love asking our guests if there were one or more of those tactics um, that are always involved in any leadership effort that really resonated with you. And I was curious, uh, maybe one or one or two that might have resonated with you that you've used throughout your career. Yes, I think um, this thought about being an entrepreneur. Is, mm. is key. And mm-hmm. I think um, that kind of goes back to me asking the questions and stepping outside of my um, comfort zone because I've always known myself to be a builder. Yeah. And a lot of people are pushed externally, go start your own business, go and, you know, build that community. Um, but everybody is not meant to do that for themselves. That's Some people right. are meant to do that 
um, within organizations. Yeah. And what I have found is that I have an innate strength and capability to do just that, mm-hmm. to measure, to build, and to um, really hold people accountable. And so I, I really, you know, that concept, as I read it, I started to think more about what it means to build a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy from the bottom up. Yeah. And that's what Anna Plan brought me in to do. And when mm-hmm. I ascended to the CHRO role, what I started to ask myself is now, what does it look like to expand our people strategy to include more retention and more opportunities and more thoughts around how we meet our customers at their level and and um, actually secure their planning needs and help them make strong business decisions. And when I tell you that, like being an entrepreneur is in some cases harder than being an entrepreneur. It is because <laughs> you're having to work within the red right. tape and office politics Correct. and the industry <laughs> dynamics, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And so w- when you think about that, that is something that you have to think through yeah. And you have to start to really do what I would, you know, a, a normal SWOT analysis, right? Yeah. Right. What, what are the strengths of the product that you have? What are the weaknesses of the strategy? What are some of the uh, industry opportunities or, or industry threats that you need to be thinking through? And mm-hmm. And the more I think about it, I really align with that because for me, questioning what processes already exist so that we can increase efficiencies and have better (laughs) outcomes are what I pride myself on doing. That is amazing. And, you know, I think almost every employer seeks that from Mm -hmm. their um, organization. You get rewarded for finding ways to improve or build new products uh, or build upon, build new product services or processes or improve upon current products, you know, services. Yes. And that's what you, you know, that's what they're looking for. And that's what you get rewarded for. And you're, and you're sitting on your hands, not doing anything, um, but checking into email. Yes. You know, that is not what will cause the leaders to really recognize what your, right. your contributions and what you're doing. Or and move the business forward. Or yeah. move the business forward, right? Like exactly. <laughs> innovation is key. Yes. 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 <laughs> you know, we always know when we see a good leader, we kind of know in our hearts. It's hard to describe it, but we know when we see a good one and we know when one is half struggling, not doing so well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I want you to think about a time or situation where you either witnessed or experienced leadership gone wrong. And I don't want you to mention anyone or any company in particular, but can you just share a little bit about what was happening when something about that leadership effort or something the person did went wrong and how that affected the whole either initiative or team? Well, it's interesting. I mean, we have a number of, I I have a number of experiences that we can pull on, but I'll I'll just keep it general and say, and actually tie it back to one of your, um, one of your principles, right? Uh Like you, you talk about leading, right. And leading, um, with this stakeholder savvy. Yes. And I will tell you working in the federal government for 10 years and working for very large agencies, I witnessed what it means to say is not what you know, but who you know. Mm. Literally mm-hmm. witnessed it every day. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that came because within the federal space, there are changes of administration every four to eight years. Um, there are policy changes daily. Um, there are um, people's lives that are impacted <laughs> by minute by minute. Wow. But what I found is that leaders who had the innate ability to, number one, listen and understand what the American people wanted, mm-hmm. and more importantly, knew who to talk to and in what order mm-hmm. they needed to talk to the people mm-hmm. to resolve the conflict problem or issue were the most successful. So when I saw a leader who was unsuccessful, especially in the federal space, it was because I, I saw a lot of this during administration changes. Yeah, and sure. we have new people come in who would... Um, you know, have this air or or about them that they were more important or knew more because they are now connected to whoever the new political leader was. Mm -hmm. And they would discount 
all of the knowledge and contributions of the, the federal workers who have been there 20 or 30 years um, and wouldn't even ask their opinions, ask about background, content, issues, anything. Mm-hmm. And they quickly came to realize, I mean, that 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 attitude maybe lasted 30 days. Right. They quickly came to find out that if you did not talk to the gatekeeper, right? Like if you just omitted that program manager who had sat in the role and managed that program for 20 years that you couldn't get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the lessons that I learned um, from the federal government that I actually took with me to Google, and I think partly why I was so successful there is because I recognized that each member of the team played a very important role. Yeah, And it wasn't about the title that you held, but more importantly, about the contributions that you made to the team. Right, And as you think about stakeholder savvy. It is about knowing what information you need from that stakeholder and how to connect the dots with the information that's given. That's true. And a lot of that, in my opinion, just based on what I've seen is about Mm -hmm. making sure that you talk to um, the right stakeholders in the right successive order and making sure you close the loop. Close the loop. And if I can, yes, and let me add to that. (laughs) And As you have conversations, make sure you touch base on topics or items that are important to them too. Yes. Right. So it resonates with them so that you're gaining their buy-in. Absolutely. At the same time. It's all about the buy-in. Karen, it is. Nail on the head. (laughs) All about the (laughs) buy-in. Stakeholder engagement is all about buy-in. It is. Yes. (laughs) Love it, it, love it, love it. Um, so a couple last questions. I know we're running a, sh- a little short on time, but um, I must get these in. Um, one of the th- uh, few months ago, I spoke at um, the Global Talent Summit 2022 okay. at at the Gallup headquarters in D.C. Oh. Mm-hmm. And um, I was speaking on um, some of the lessons in the book, but then also mega trends that are occurring in the world of work. And one in particular, I just wanted to get your thoughts on was we talked about the DEI B plus space. And Mm -hmm. one of the megatrends that I spoke about was how leaders in general, leaders were very interested in the, I mean, we've had many revolutions of um, social justice awakenings and people, you know, very focused in the inclusion space. Mm -hmm. Um, And it happened during the pandemic, but now companies are struggling with sustainability Mm -hmm. and moving their strategies forward um, and keeping the same intense focus. And so we had some rich conversations in the room around that. And I'm curious, is that something that you two are seeing in the industry, Um, whether or not it's at Anaplan or not, but in the industry, do you Mm -hmm. see your peers I won't say struggling, but really trying to keep their organizations having diversity and inclusion top of mind. You know what? I think what you're seeing and experiencing is a shift. Mm. It is a shift in priorities. So that naturally leads to this inability to maintain the same momentum that you saw um, Mm. in 2020. And I think the macroeconomic headwinds are making it such that companies are able to easily excuse the fact that they have made little to no progress. Good point. Look, I strongly believe that you cannot take your foot off their neck right now. Can't do it. Not at all. I think now more than ever, as people are reimagining what their next jobs will look like, some people are being laid off in various industries. Others are expanding their scope and taking on new roles. It's important for people to make sure that they feel like they belong. That's true. And so I really did focus my last um, 2022 around belonging and published, mm-hmm. um, co-published with the um, Center for Equity and Gender Leadership with UC Berkeley, a belonging mm-hmm. playbook. Oh, and nice. In that playbook, you know, we really talk about what it means to have these key drivers of belonging and why that matters to the bottom line. And over, I would want to say in 2022, we talked a lot about retaining talent, um, what it means to identify who critical talent is, what it means to create this um, employee onboarding experience that's good, what our employee engagement model looks like. So to your to answer your question directly, yes, companies are 
companies are struggling because they're shifting their priorities. Yeah. And so I tell our leaders, I don't want to hear about what your priorities are. I want to see what your priorities are. And a lot of times oh, yes. you can see what the priorities are if you follow the money. Yes. I yes. started my You're career so in finance. Right. I started my career in finance. And even in the federal government, I often worked for the CFO. Mm-hmm. And she, I, I worked for a CFO, um, Radha Sakar. I will never forget her. And she says, look, people can tell you what their priorities are, but it, you know exactly what the priorities are by how they fund them. That's right. That's so right. we have to continue to provide those human and financial resources to our DEIB initiatives Yes, and continue to ask for the metrics that show the progress, mm-hmm. albeit small in some cases, mm-hmm. let's understand that this is not an overnight yeah. um, fix and mm-hmm. that it will, con- it will take continued pressure and resources to see and hold folks accountable. That's a drop the mic moment right there. Yes. That's <laughs> what we need to try to infuse and keep top of mind for all of our leaders that are in decision-making seats. Yes. Um, especially at the priority and budget levels. Yes. Yes, you know, yes, yes. Um, oh my gosh, we could have a whole nother <laughs> I can't <laughs> stop on that. Yes, I don't. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, one last thing before I let you go. Our final segment is called Full Disclosure. Mm-hmm. There will not be any gotcha questions. I promise that. But it's just a couple of fun questions uh, to ask you if you don't mind. Okay. So the first one is, um, I'm curious, what is one either app or resource that you just can't live without? in your daily life. Oh, I know about the journaling. So that's yeah, good. <laughs> the journaling was a, is, is one for me. I will tell you um, that I can't live without. Or you'd hate to live without. Yeah. Anything Ooh, on yeah. your phone that you go to constantly to help you keep organized or? Well, I will say um, I do my best thinking in the shower. Do the you? shower or on a walk. So we talked right before this started, like I got to get my walk today. And so the um, notes app on my iPhone is something that I have right now. I have 700 different notes because as I'm walking, sometimes something will just come to me. And so I have to jot it down just that minute or I get out of the shower and I'm like, oh, my God, let me jot that down really quickly. (laughs) And um, my phone is always near me. The journals are not. And so I use that as a way to capture some of the ideas and and then come back to them at a later time. So, oh, yeah. That's perfect. I do the same thing. I listen to um, a lot of things when I'm walking, but I do listen to some podcasts as well. And there's usually a nugget or something that I will either want to look up as yes. a resource or remember. And I definitely use the notes um, for that. Yep, I think yep. you have maybe one more note than I do, but I have a lot of notes as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Probably need to clean them out. Me too. Me too. <laughs> What would be a, a great birthday present for you? Time with family and friends that I really yeah. love and care about. Because I'm going to tell you, you yes. can get everything else back, but you cannot get time. You cannot get time. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love mm-hmm. that. <laughs> what is a recent movie you saw, article you read, or um, song that you love to listen to? Ooh. So I'm like a, a old soul kind of person. Um, <laughs> and what movie did we see? Um, I've actually done some like mother, like some some kid movies um, kind of dates. Yeah, with but little ones you, like that. <laughs> yep. And so the one that we watched most recently was the one called Yes Day on Netflix. And it was really around um, a family um, with three kids, mom, dad, and the kids said that the parents were no fun and the parent parents said no to everything all the time. And they had um, a bet that the parents couldn't say yes to everything that they asked for within parameters. Right, right. Man, just watching that with my kids um, actually had me thinking about what it is and how I parent and, (laughs) um, you know, how they think and what they think is reasonable or unreasonable. So (laughs) I just, again, going back to what is a great birthday present for me, it's really about time. So that that yes, yes day movie is something that (laughs) I would encourage all parents to go take a look at. It's cute. (laughs) It's easy. And if you have kids, elementary age kids like I do, it'll give you a couple ideas. 
Well, I have a, a grown daughter myself, but I'm gonna go back and watch that it's too. Cute. It's cute. It's really, really cute. I think she'll uh, like it, and you will too. I like it. Yes, it's cute. She just graduated from college, so yeah, I, I can still appreciate uh, the messaging. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Oh, all right. Shuri, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for the oh. gift of your time and the gift of the knowledge that you shared with our audience members. Thank you so much for having me, Karen. It's a pleasure. And I hope that you have a wonderful day. Thank you. I will. And listeners, thank you so much again for listening to another episode of the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast. Please like, subscribe, and share with your friends. We'd love to expand our network and our impact and influence. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Have a fantastic day yourselves and take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed our conversation today with Sharika Epco former SVP and Interim Chief Human Resources Officer at Anaplan. Links to her bio, her entry into our leadership playbook, and additional resources can be found in the show notes, both on your favorite podcast platform of choice and at leadyourgamepodcast.com. And now for Karen's take on our topic of stepping outside of your comfort zone. You know, Sharika did a great job of sharing with us how to step outside of our comfort zone. And now I want to cap off her sage advice by emphasizing the benefits upon doing so. So one of the benefits is that the exciting parts of life are out there waiting for you. You just have to grab them by the horns. Real life exists beyond the bubble of your own personal thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. So I encourage you to embrace all possible experiences, not just the ones you're comfortable with. Another benefit has to do with challenging yourself. You should challenge yourself to dip into and utilize your intellectual horsepower. You have no idea what you're made of until you use your expertise for ventures outside of your daily normal activities. Another benefit involves taking risks. You know, taking risks, regardless of the outcome, are growth experiences. Even if you make mistakes, those become learning experiences that you can tap into into the future. Remember, the word fail really means first attempt in learning. And then the last benefit I wanted to share with you is that leaving your comfort zone ultimately helps you to deal with change and making a change in a much better way. Each time you transition, you move to another level of excellence. And inevitably, these life transitions will transform you for the better. Maybe better understanding these benefits of stepping outside of your comfort zone will give you the courage to take a chance and see what the world has to offer you. Thanks so much for listening to the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast, and we'll see you next week. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening to the Lead at the Top of Your Game podcast, where we help you lead your seat at any employer, business, or industry in which you choose to play. You can check out the show notes, additional episodes, bonus resources, and also submit guest recommendations on our website at leadyourgamepodcast.com. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn by searching for the name Karen Rhodes with Karen being spelled K-A-R-A-N. And if you like the show, the greatest gift you can give would be to subscribe and leave a rating on your podcast platform of choice. This podcast has been a production of Shockingly Different Leadership a global consultancy which helps organizations execute their people, talent development, and organizational effectiveness initiatives on an on-demand project or contract basis. Huge thanks to our production and editing team for a job well done. Goodbye for now.